Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to kick off something we're going to do for most of the rest of this month that I'm calling Autonomous Territory Friday, which I know is not a catchy name, but it is what it is. And this was not planned, it just kind of fell into place. For the next three Fridays, we're going to be looking at various autonomous regions within other countries. In this case, it's going to be an overseas territory and it is Bermuda. So I'm going to read you the introduction of this book so you get a good idea of what Bermuda is like, and then I'll show you all the pictures and we'll read all the little boxes. And we'll do the same for the next two territories coming up in the next few Fridays. Sound like a plan? Let's do it. Oh, and there will be other books about autonomous territories coming up later on throughout the year. It's just very strange how there's three Fridays in a row where I'm profiling different autonomous territory. So that being said, let's get into Bermuda. Let's learn a lot more about this really interesting place. Bermuda today. A gently curving crescent of islands rises from the sea in the Western Atlantic Ocean. From a distance, it appears like one formation but it is really a collection of hundreds of coral islands, keys, and islets. This archipelago, or string of islands, is officially called the Bermuda Islands, though most people know it as Bermuda. Although Bermuda is often thought of as being part of the Caribbean, it is not. It is located far to the north of its Caribbean neighbors. In fact, Bermuda is the most northerly group of coral islands in the world, and the only coral atoll in the Atlantic. Putting Bermuda on the map. Bermuda is located to the east of the United States and midway between Nova Scotia and the West Indies. It is almost 775 miles southeast of New York City and 1,030 miles northeast of Miami, Florida. Bermuda is part of the United Kingdom even though it is located 3,445 miles away from London, England. The, the map I'm using here is a Caribbean map, but that's because the map of Bermuda is up there, but I couldn't get it in frame. So it is what it is. I promise Bermuda is on the page that I'm using. I'm not just using the Caribbean because I think it's in the Caribbean. It is not. Despite this distance, Bermuda is the oldest British territory in the world. Of the many islands and islets that make up its archipelago, 20 are inhabited by people today, but this was not the case more than 500 years ago when European explorers first sighted the islands. At that time, Bermuda was an uninhabited environment occupied mainly by birds and bursting with plant life. Spanish and Portuguese explorers may have discovered Bermuda first, but it was the English who made it a colony. Bermuda was settled almost by chance when a sinking English ship wrecked on Bermuda's surrounding reefs and its passengers sought refuge on the island. Admiral Sir George Summers, who led the passengers to safety in Bermuda, is still considered a national hero. For a long time, Bermuda was known primarily as the Summers Isles, and the town of St. George is named in Admiral Sir George Summers's honor. And there's a beautiful picture of the example of the very lush wildlife that George Summers and his passengers would have come across. The Early Colony When colonists arrived, Bermuda was a densely forested, subtropical ecosystem. Many of the plants and animals that live in Bermuda are unique among the other islands of the Atlantic. Unfortunately, colonial activities diminished the native plant and animal life over the years. However, today, more than 350 bird species can still be spotted in Bermuda. Many are migratory and use Bermuda's environment as a feeding ground during their long journeys north and south. Bermuda's biodiversity also explodes off the coast. There, hundreds of species of coral, fish, marine mammals, sea turtles, and more share the waters surrounding the island. Bermuda's potential as a maritime base grew alongside its population. The original colony established profitable activities like shipbuilding, salt trading, and agriculture. Its economy grew through the labor of indentured servants and enslaved workers until slavery was abolished in the British territories. 
Through the years, Bermuda adapted to the social and economic changes made necessary by war, conflict, and expansion across the Atlantic. An Island Paradise in the early 20th century, Bermuda realized that one of its greatest economic assets was its natural beauty. Gorgeous scenery, sunny skies, and mild temperatures meant that Bermuda had the makings of an island paradise. The country marketed this beauty, and soon travelers were arriving from around the world. Tourism was the main economic industry for most of the 1900s. At the end of the century, Bermuda seized a new opportunity in international business. This shift is responsible for the economic prosperity now enjoyed in Bermuda. Tourism and international business together have made Bermuda a high-income country today. Bermuda is still a major tourist destination, especially for travelers from North America. Pink sand beaches and adventurous activities like snorkeling, scuba diving, and deep sea fishing are famous attractions. Bermuda is the perfect place for those looking for a taste of British culture outside of Great Britain. In addition, there are colorful festivals, delicious foods, and a population of people with diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds. Bermuda has been a favorite spot for artists and writers inspired by the environment. Of course, Bermuda is not always a paradise. The country has a complex history steeped in everything from rum running and piracy to espionage and racial strife. Racial inequalities are rooted in the island's history of slavery and discrimination. Pressure for change reached a tipping point through organized protests, demonstrations, and riots in the second half of the 20th century. They ushered in major reforms in Bermuda's government and society, but the struggle for equity continues today. Some of the biggest hurdles facing modern-day Bermuda have to do with global climate change and the pressures of a large population on a small stretch of land. Fortunately, Bermuda's government not only cares about its fragile environment, but it is also willing to spend money and time to protect it. It is unclear what other challenges lie ahead, but Bermudians have resources, resilience, and inventiveness on their side. All right, here is a fantastic picture of Bermuda from above. How neat, and you can see all of the beautiful coral surrounding it there too. Here's a political map of Bermuda. You can see all the different parishes in the capital city of Hamilton. Here's a box called An Unexpected Discovery. In 1907, two young boys named Carl Gibbons and Edgar Hollis were playing cricket. A strong hit sent the ball rolling away. Suddenly it disappeared down a mysterious hole. Following the ball, the two boys discovered some unbelievably huge and intricate underground limestone caves. Shaped like a Gothic cathedral, these crystal caves, so called for the clear water inside them, are now a favorite tourist attraction in Bermuda. There are more than 150 limestone caves scattered throughout Bermuda, many of them reaching deep below sea level. Experts believe many of the caves date back to the Ice Age. Exploration in these caves has resulted in the discovery of 75 water and cave adapted species, including worms, mites, and crustaceans. Just something you don't really expect on a coral island in the ocean, right? It's really cool caves like that. It's neat. There's a sweet ibis bird. And they're so cute. And here are the pink sand beaches, which pink sand is made up of, does it say down here? Foraminifera. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. It's basically dead sea creatures all crunched up and washed up on shore and very fine to make sand, basically. Endemic species. An endemic species is one that comes to a place naturally and then evolves into a unique form that is not found anywhere else. A clue that a species is endemic here is the addition of Bermuda to its name. That means that the species is only found on this unique archipelago. Bermuda's endemic plant species include trees like the Bermuda cedar, Bermuda palmetto, and Bermuda olive wood. Oh, 
I know it's getting too early when I hear the Bart train go by. <laughs> Forest floors used to be covered with species such as Bermuda sedge, the moss Bermuda trichostoma, Bermuda maiden hair fern, and the shrub Bermuda snowberry. Flowers like the Bermudiana still bloom on the island, and nature lovers may come across the Bermuda buckeye butterfly, the archipelago's only endemic butterfly. The Bermuda skink is the island's historic lizard resident. The Bermuda petrel is more commonly known as the cahow, cahow. I know it's based on the sound it makes, so I wonder if it's cahow, I'm not sure. Since the 1950s, it has made a miraculous recovery from near extinction thanks to dedicated conservation projects. There's a hibiscus, very iconic tropical flower. Let's read about the Spittle Pond Nature Reserve. Many call Spittle Pond Nature Reserve in Smith's Parish, with its rocky shores, salt marsh habitat, mudland flats, and leafy trails, the most beautiful place in Bermuda. It is Bermuda's largest nature reserve, spanning 64 acres. About 20 bird species live in the wetland habitat, including waterfowl like herons, sandpipers, and egrets. More than 200 other bird species feed in the area during their yearly migration. Visitors might also catch a glimpse of two of Bermuda's endemic species, the Bermuda buckeye butterfly or the Bermuda skink. The main pond at the reserve contains brackish water. Fresh water turns brackish when storms or floods send salt water into a, the pond. Black mangroves grow along the main pond, thriving in this habitat. A geological formation known as the checkerboard is also part of the reserve. The pressures of plate tectonics have resulted in a checkerboard of fractured limestone. Here's the history chapter with this fantastic statue of George Summers. He is so happy. And um, if you're a channel member of my channel, I read these chapters in a very slow, soft-spoken voice. Um, it's audio only, just for channel members. So if you want to hear me read this chapter eventually, uh, you can check out my membership. Portuguese Rock. One of the earliest landings in Bermuda was recorded in a cliffside rock carving. The inscription includes the year 1543, two initials, and a cross. The initials have been interpreted as RP and likely stand for the Latin word, words Rex Portugaliae, or King of Portugal. The cross resembles that of the Portuguese Order of Christ. Historians believe the rock was carved by sailors from a Portuguese slave ship that crashed on the nearby reefs. Survivors lived on the island while they constructed a small seaworthy vessel made from salvaged ship materials and turtle shells. After leaving their mark on Bermuda, the remaining crew sailed for Puerto Rico. The landmark was long called Spanish Rock due to a misunderstanding of its inscription. It was renamed Portuguese Rock in 2009. Although the original rock is no longer in place, a bronze cast of the inscription can be visited in Spittle Pond. Here's a reconstruction of the uh, ship that George Summers was manning when it crashed in Bermuda and started the first settlement. It's called the Deliverance. A letter from George Washington. George Washington sent his own request for gunpowder to Bermuda on September 6th, 1775, and he said, We are informed that there is a very large magazine in your island under the, a very feeble guard. We know not, therefore, to what extent to solicit your assistance in availing ourselves of this supply, but if your favor and friendship to North America and its liberties have not been misrepresented, I persuade myself you may, consistent with your own safety, promote and further this scheme so as to give it the fairest prospect of success. Be assured that in this case the whole power and execution of my influence will be made with the Honorable Continental Congress, that your island may not only be supplied with provisions, but experience every other mark of affection and friendship that the grateful citizens of a free country can bestow on its brethren and benefactors." Which is basically, can we have your gunpowder please? I promise. We'll, we'll treat you really nice once we're independent. The words of Mary Prince. 
Mary Prince published her autobiography, The History of Mary Prince, a West Indian Slave Narrative, in 1831. She was the first black woman to publish a book in Britain. In it, Prince wrote, Oh, the horrors of slavery! How the thought of it pains my heart! But the truth ought to be told of it, and what my eyes have seen I think it is my duty to relate. For few people in England know what slavery is. I have been a slave. I have felt what a slave feels, and I know what a slave knows, and I would have all the good people in England to know it too, that they break our chains and set us free. Here is Fort St. Catherine, built by the, the British to protect the island. And this is the Royal Naval Dockyard today. It says now it's a civic center. Big British flag right there. And this is the flag of Bermuda. You can see their, their emblem here and then the, the British flag there. There's a zoomy zoomy. <laughs> Bermudian citizenship. Bermudian citizenship is difficult to attain. Even children born in Bermuda are not officially Bermudian unless one parent is native to the country. No outsider can become a Bermudian, gain citizenship, vote, or buy real estate unless they marry a Bermudian and live with that person for more than 10 years. This is the only democratic country in the world with these rules. Since 2002, Bermudian citizens have been automatically granted full British citizenship by the British Overseas Territories Act. This means that native Bermudians can more easily study, work, and live in Britain. Naturalized Bermudians, or those who have gained citizenship through marriage, are eligible, but they have to apply for British citizenship. Here's the House of Assembly and Supreme Court building. It's called the Sessions House in Hamilton. On the basis of race and sex. Black men in Bermuda who owned property were able to vote and occupy elected offices at a time when all women, black or white, were barred from voting. Some black politicians, like Dr. Eustace McCann in the House of Assembly, worried that opening the vote to property-owning women would only cement the harmful property requirements. However, McCann voted to pass the Women's Suffrage Bill in 1944. He said, when one speaks about keeping the vote from women on the basis of sex, one must also think about keeping certain people from getting jobs because of the color of their skin. I shall vote for this measure today because I hate to see any group enslaved by the power of others and refused their legitimate rights. I call on all assemblymen to consider these matters that would grant to others the same privileges now proposed for the suffrage society. Before we read this, let's look at this picture. This is Hamilton, the capital city. Looks very quaint. The Old State House. Bermuda's oldest stone building sits on the town of St. George. It is the Old State House, and it was built in 1620 by Governor Nathaniel Butler in what was then the capital of Bermuda. Its limestone blocks are held together by a combination of turtle oil and lime. This building was central to Bermuda's government until Hamilton became the capital in 1815. The old state house has been rented by the government to local Freemasons for more than 200 years. Rent is set at one peppercorn each year and has not changed since the original agreement in 1816. In a fancy ceremony held at King Square in late April, the governor and town mayor in full regalia accept the peppercorn, which is presented on a silver plate that is on a velvet cushion. The parade and activities that accompany this payment cost thousands of dollars. <laughs> Old traditions die hard, right? Here's Bermuda's currency. It's the Bermuda dollar, and it has lots of fishies and plants on it. It's very colorful. There's a bunch of shipping coming in there. Oh, we've got a box here about Bermuda sloops. Cedar sloops made the activities of early Bermudian fishermen, salt traders, privateers, and smugglers possible. This fast ship was typically constructed with a long and narrow body, one mast, and triangular sails. 
native Bermudian red cedar gave strength, durability, and speed to sloops. Most were crafted and constructed by free and enslaved black Bermudians. Sloops carried Bermudians to the salt beds of the Turks' islands, and then delivered that salt to ports in Newfoundland and New England. Their speed helped the Royal Navy chase down slave ships in the Caribbean in its quest to break up the Atlantic slave trade. Smugglers, pirates, and privateers also relied on the quickness of their sloops to help them acquire goods at sea. In the 1820s, shipbuilders in New England and Maryland adapted the Bermudian sloop model to make their own vessels. Bermuda's shipbuilding business declined soon after. A dwindling population of cedar trees was the final blow to Bermuda's once thriving sloop business. Onion mania. We'll see pictures of the onions later. Here's a picture of St. George. It's the largest city in Bermuda, and like it said in the other box, a formal cap former capital. Let's read about a landmark hotel. One hotel and tourist destination that has been involved in Bermuda's history for more than a century is the Hamilton Princess Hotel. Construction began in 1884, and the hotel opened its doors in January 1885. Now called the Hamilton Princess and Beach Club, the hotel offers luxury accommodations and access to Bermuda's famous pink sand beaches. Throughout its history, the hotel has hosted celebrities, politicians, and authors. Mark Twain was a familiar sight to early guests of the hotel. He was known to read aloud from his works and sign autographs during his visits. When World War II diminished tourism significantly, the hotel closed to visitors. For five years, it served as headquarters for the British intelligence operation in the Atlantic. The operation was supervised by Sir William Stevenson, better known by his code name Intrepid. As many as 1,200 people worked in this hotel during the war, searching for spy messages in the mail. The Hog on the Penny Take a look at a Bermuda penny today and you will see the image of a hog engraved on it. When English settlers came to Bermuda, hogs, first deposited on the island to multiply as a food source for shipwrecked or seafaring explorers, were some of the most numerous animals they saw. King James I granted Bermuda permission to mint the first colonial coins in 1615. They were made from copper and had an image of a hog on one side and a ship on the other. The coins became unpopular since they could not be used off of the island and they were rarely found after 1650. In 1970, Bermuda adopted its own new currency. The penny bears an image of a hog on one side as a nod to Bermuda's history. How beautiful, beautiful coral. Lovely. Going green. If people are going to spend a vacation on Bermuda, they should bring their walking shoes. Only Bermudians are permitted to drive traditional cars in Bermuda, and they must follow a strict set of rules for car use. There are many other alternatives, of course. People can take a ride on city buses, jump on a ferry, or grab a local taxi. Many tourists choose to walk or bicycle, Bermudians call these pedal bikes, from place to place. Travelers can also rent a scooter or a tiny two-seat electric car called a Renault Twizy to get around the islands. Just remember, Bermudians drive on the left side of the road. A pretty bird over here. An eastern bluebird. Lovely. It's a box about the Bermuda cedar. The first humans to land on Bermuda came to a place of lush forests bursting with trees like the Bermuda cedar. As people settled on the islands, they introduced activities, pests, invasive plants, and diseases that diminished the forests. Early explorers released pigs to multiply into an abundant food source, but the pigs uprooted the forest floor in their quest for food. Rats from ships also disturbed the forest's natural cycle by eating seeds. Settlers cleared the forests to make room for agriculture or to supply timber for shipbuilding and construction. The Bermuda cedar suffered from all of these factors, but the introduction of a pest in the 1940s nearly wiped it out. 
two kinds of virus spreading insects called oyster shell scale and cedar scale arrived in Bermuda. Between 1946 and 1951, 95% of Bermuda cedars died. It is estimated that cedar scale killed around 3 million trees. This is a beautiful long tailed bird. And there's a sweet, sweet green turtle. <laughs> Let's read about it. A welcome return. At one time, Bermuda's beaches offered safe havens for a variety of turtles to lay their eggs. However, when settlers realized that these creatures were edible, the turtles were almost completely exterminated. From 1968 to 1978, Bermudian environmentalists flew thousands of green turtle eggs to the area from Costa Rica and buried them on various beaches. Sea turtles returned to lay eggs on the beach where they were born, so scientists hoped that the hatchlings would one day lay new eggs in Bermuda. Initial signs that this mission had been successful were discovered in 2015. For the first time in almost 100 years, green turtles were naturally born in Bermuda. Scientists counted 90 hatched eggs. The Bermuda Turtle Project continues the work of studying sea turtles in order to better contribute to their conservation. The group has tagged more than 3,500 green turtles, tracking their movements through the ocean. Here's some top shell, little sea creature <laughs> that apparently is delicious, but it's now a protected species because I guess people almost ate all of them. Some people hanging out on a lovely day. Here's Mr. Happy Man. Johnny Barnes was an icon in Bermuda. Every morning from 3.40 a.m. to 10 a.m., White-bearded Barnes stood at a roundabout in Hamilton and waved to people walking, cycling, and driving by. The retired bus driver completed this routine each day, regardless of the weather. Barnes passed away in 2016 at age 93, but he's still remembered for the greetings he shared with neighbors, wandering tourists, schoolchildren, rushing professionals, and everyone in between from 1986 to 2015. Barnes was labeled the friendliest man in Bermuda, Mr. Happy Man, and Mr. Feelgood. His status as a national treasure was confirmed when his image was reproduced in a bronze statue. The statue now stands at the roundabout where Barnes delivered his morning greetings. There's also a portrait of Barnes hung in Bermuda's Visitors Information Center. Barnes was the subject of two short documentary films, Mr. Happy Man and Welcoming Arms. I feel like lots of cities around the world have a Mr. Happy Man character, whether he brings uh, like joy and happiness or confusion <laughs> or scares. In case of San Francisco, we had the Bushman. He would scare people for fun. Some graves here, and it, this is a, a black graveyard, apparently. St. Peter's Church. Famous Faces In the past, famous faces seen around Bermuda included the singer David Bowie and his wife Iman. The first supermodel, Twiggy, was another visitor from Great Britain. Film stars Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones have a home on the island. Douglas has been coming to the island since he was a child. His mother, Diana Dill, was born in Bermuda. Famous Bermudians include a number of well-known athletes, writers, artists, and scientists. Gina Swanson, who was crowned Miss World in 1979, hails from Bermuda. So does Shiona Torini, a stylist and costume designer, now based in the United States. Torini has designed wardrobes for the show Insecure and the film Queen and Slim. In 2019, Torini proudly served as the Grand Marshal for the Bermuda Day Parade in her home country. Some British red telephone boxes there, just so you know you're on British soil. <laughs> lovely, lovely homes. So check out these very distinct roofs. I think there's another picture of the roofs later. They're made in a way so that rain water can fall on them and get captured for fresh water. I think like every home in Bermuda has to have a rainwater catching roof. Look at this beautiful church. That is so sweet. <laughs> a 
lovely, lovely. Yeah, see, here's the roof styles you can see there. It's slanted so the water falls down it slower, and then there's catchments for rainwater. Look at that view, though. Oh my gosh. Let's read about getting around. A good system of public transportation connects all nine parishes in Bermuda. The main network is made up of ferries and buses. The bus routes head in two general directions, towards St. George's or towards Somerset. Most Bermudian households also own a car, and some have additional motorcycles or scooters for getting around. The Bermuda Railway, nicknamed Old Rattle and Shake, operated across the island from 1931 to 1948. The line traveled from Somerset to St. George's, but laying the tracks was a costly venture involving the construction of many bridges and tunnels. A 1908 ban on automobiles in Bermuda was lifted in 1946, and cars started popping up on the island. The costs of maintaining the railway soon seemed unnecessary. The old tracks were refashioned into a bicycle and pedestrian trail in the 1980s. Many Bermudians use the scenic 18-mile path for slower travel or recreation. There goes a, a little ferry carting people around the islands. This is St. Peter's Church, which um, I think, according to the caption, is the first church built in Bermuda. Look at this Bermuda Cathedral. That is lovely. This old, like, English stone um, cathedral style with the palm trees. That's great. <laughs> and here's the inside at the altar. And here's an abandoned church. Isn't that hauntingly beautiful? There's a box here. It says, Helping Hands. Bermuda has a reputation for being charitable. This community-centered spirit can be traced back to the friendly societies of the 1800s. Many Bermudians say their instinct toward generosity is rooted in their religious beliefs. When an international disaster occurs, such as the Asian tsunami of 2004, or hurricanes near Atlantic islands, Bermuda has been there to offer money and other resources to help. Faith inspires some Bermudians to volunteer in their community through local and international organizations. Some give their free time to Habitat for Humanity, which has been building and restoring affordable homes on the island since 2000. The Red Cross has operated in Bermuda since 1950 and relies on volunteers for blood donations and a task force of responders when a disaster strikes. Volunteers also assist with the Coalition for the Protection of Children, which is dedicated to making childhood in Bermuda safer and healthier. There's a little bookstore here. Follow them on Facebook. <laughs> a little trolley you can ride as a tourist to see all the sights. I'm not going to read the Bermudian expressions. <laughs> Let's see. A lovely day, enjoying the waterfront. Here is a stamp featuring the Bermuda Library, the 150th anniversary. The Masterworks Museum of Bermuda Art. It's a little British post box there next to it. These are called Moon Gates. And I think it talks about it right here. Couples who kiss under the moon gate, the wedding shaped. Uh, band, the wedding band shaped arches found throughout the island will, according to local legend, be assured a long and happy life together. Walk through one of our lovely limestone archways, make a wish, and look forward to a joyful and prosperous future. It's really sweet. Hmm, I'm gonna skip song lyrics too. <laughs> Let's see, Kali Buds, a reggae singer from Bermuda. Big celebration here of Gombe dancers. Gombe being the culture that the slaves created as a mix of like that West African cultures all getting mushed together and creating a new one. So they're uh, celebrating a holiday with this very, very colorful costumes there. Here's Mark Twain, a very iconic American writer. 
the Bermuda National Gallery. It's located on the second floor of the Hamilton City Hall. Isn't that neat? That's cool. Cedar crafts. Besides its use in shipbuilding and construction, cedar was an important material for carving and woodwork in Bermuda's past. Cabinet making was a profitable pursuit in the 17th and 18th centuries. Samuel and Henry Smith, two brothers, produced a variety of cabinets and carved furniture in their workshop with the help of enslaved workers named Noki and Augustus. Most of Bermuda's masterfully carved cabinets, woodwork, and furniture was produced by enslaved workers. Carpentry could also be a prosperous field for black Bermudians after emancipation. John Henry Jackson was a black carpenter who was born in Bermuda in 1822. A carved side table he crafted was displayed in the Great Exhibition at London's Crystal Palace in 1851. The exhibition celebrated art, science, and technology from around the globe, including Bermuda. The table is currently part of the collection of the Verdmont Historic House. And there's a picture here of the Verdmont Historic House. You can see all the wood used to build it. Gorgeous waterfall here going into this fantastic pool of water. Go for a big dip. It's like a regatta here. Some sailboats ready to race. Competing as a para athlete. Jessica Lewis began wheelchair racing when she was 13 years old in 2006. Since then, she has participated in many world competitions for her home country, Bermuda. Lewis excels as a sprinter and competes in the 100, 200, and 300 meter races. In 2012, she was the first Bermudian to ever compete in the Paralympic Games. She won a historic gold medal at the 2015 Parapan American Games in Toronto and returned to the Paralympics in 2016. After the Parapan American Games in 2019, Lewis won two gold medals and one silver medal in her events. Lewis has also collected a variety of awards in Bermuda, including Most Fascinating Person of 2015 and Female Athlete of the Year for 2019. Smith's goal in 2021 was to bring home a gold medal from the Tokyo Paralympics. I looked her up. I, I searched her Twitter. Uh, she actually won fourth in her big race at the Tokyo Paralympics, but that's still very good. <laughs> Look at this shipwreck that's all covered in coral that you can dive in and explore like your aerial flounder. <laughs> National Heroes Day is being celebrated here with big colorful costumes. Some hot cross buns. Hot cross buns, they look so delectable. <laughs> Sand sculpture. The Bermuda International Sand Sculpture Competition attracts artists and spectators every September in Horseshoe Bay. Participants compete in different categories that are broken down based on talent and experience. There's also a family category so that multiple generations can get involved in a group effort. Teams can have up to six people who fill large plots of sand with masterworks. The sculptures are quite creative, and visitors can watch the artists crafting their sand art. Past entries have been themed around current events, works of fiction, sorry, <laughs> plants and animals, island lore, or Bermuda itself. I have turrets, so it pops up every once in a while. Front Street in Hamilton, kind of like the main street. And, oh my gosh, another Gombe dancer celebrating Boxing Day. I have to have another tick, hold on. Moving on. <laughs> Very great. Food, there's their onions. <laughs> they grow wild all over the islands. Um, cassava pie. I don't know how I feel about that, but over here, a fish chowder. That looks amazing. I'm a big seafood person. <laughs> Special meals. Sunday breakfast or brunch is a favorite mealtime in Bermuda. The most traditional Sunday morning plate is filled with boiled salted codfish and boiled potatoes. Bacon, onions, and tomato sauce are added, then topped off with a hard-boiled egg and slices of banana and avocado. 
thanks to its links with England, afternoon tea is another tradition in Bermuda. Whether for locals at home or tourists at hotels, tea is often served between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. Silver, fine china, and linens introduce a sense of formality. It's time for my medication. Commonly, the hot tea is accompanied by finger sandwiches with thinly sliced cucumbers. Scones covered in strawberry jam add a sweet touch. Codfish, boiled potatoes, sliced bananas, and various toppings. It says that's quite a combination. Well, that's the end. We've got some Johnny Cakes there. <laughs> and yeast popcorn. I guess that's a thing. I bet it's delicious. I love popcorn. And let's look at the big map of Bermuda. Very cool. I like the shape of it. And there's lots and lots of little islands all throughout and around it. And that's where Bermuda is located in the world. So that will be the end for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to join me next Friday when we visit, let's just say a very big island. That's an autonomous territory. Thank you again. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. I'm gonna go take my Tourette's medication and lie down. So I hope that you have a very good, good, good night. Do you think this is Mr. Happy Man? I tried looking it up. And uh, all it says in the book is that this is a stock photo, but that looks very much like the description in the book, doesn't it? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Either way, this is a very happy, smiling man. <laughs> Thank you again. Have a very good, 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 good night.